Hello, my children! This is the last of the Nostalgia Critic uh, retrospectives that I'm gonna put on the website before we just start jumping into Demo Reel. Uh, so I was trying to think about what would be the best thing to talk about. Certainly talked about the worst movies I ever saw and the best reviews. Uh, decided, let's talk about just my top 11 favorite moments. Uh, which is really tough because I was going through a list. God, I made a lot of these videos. I, I was going through a list of the reviews. Oh, that's a funny moment. I remember that moment. Blah, blah, blah. I came up with something like 27. It was like... Okay, so th there's a lot of jokes I really like. So just keep in mind, if you don't see, like, your favorite on there or something, chances are it was like... It's just... It has to just be 11. So, uh... Uh, yeah. These are pretty much out of all the ones I can think of that I went through. Uh, these are my top 11 favorite funniest moments. <laughs> Bunny boobies. If you don't remember, this is the first time uh, in the Space Jam review where I talk about the fact that they pretty much gave... They sexualized a rabbit, you know, in a Looney Tunes cartoon. I mean, and it's not like just a foil for Bugs to go, woo, you know, or something like that. I mean, just a walk-off character or something. Uh, I mean, it was like one of the main characters. And it's just... I like this joke because... I started seeing this go around for a while, and it's diminished a bit, you know, because people are just like, oh, hey, women have personalities too. Oh, we can break that. Um, but, like, for the longest time, especially around that time period, for whatever reason, a lot of these writers got the idea in kids' programming that's like, you know, just we don't, not even kids' programming, a lot of programming, we don't know how to write a female character. Like, they're aliens. Like, they're a foreign race. And it's always, it just fascinates me because it's like, Write it the same way, you know, I don't want to say the same way you write a guy, but in the same way that whatever makes a male character interesting, do that with the female. Well, this guy is funny because he's a doofus that doesn't know any better. Make her a doofus that doesn't know any better. It's always this fear. I'm getting off track. Okay, so this is the first sexualized, you know, bunny I've seen in a movie. This is before I knew about, you know, some people that I make a joke saying like, look, we don't want to fuck bunnies, and... The internet has since shown me that there are quite a few who want... To, I mean, that's neither here or there. Uh, you know, for a... You know, people that go just want to see Looney Tunes do their thing. You know, they want to see the Looney Tunes be Looney. And just seeing this... It wasn't as much like the bunny boobies as much as they're just trying to make a sexualized Looney Tune. With no other personality. Uh, and, and not even a funny sexy. It's just like, no, you're legitimately supposed to find her hot. It's just like, dude... Like, the first female Looney Tune you really have, outside of Granny, who, you know, who was never a main character. Uh, and they actually created this character! You can start from scratch, you don't have to work with anything, and you just make it a slutty bitch <laughs> who has nothing to her. And I thought, just by throwing these big-breasted... All the early tunes are naked! Practically, I mean, it's like if you were to take it off, shit, they probably have nipples. It'd be like the Batman suit. <laughs> you know, the Schumacher Batman suit. It's like there's no purpose. Keep it, you know, bad writers of female characters and Joel Schumacher, the nipples don't make a character. That's a very odd thing I have to explain, but, you know, this does not replace this. <laughs> You know, I I'm sure for some people, very desperate it does. But for the rest of the thinking world that wants to be entertained, you know, it it really doesn't. So, um, and I I'm not going into a whole, I know I'm going to get people saying, you're bashing furries. I don't understand furries. I don't care. You know, whatever does it for you, does it for you. If it's sexual, if it's not. I don't care. I, I, it's the same thing with, like, bronies and stuff like that. If you like it, like it. Who gives a fuck? <laughs> it's more that this is the Looney Tunes. Like, the most, you know, the, some of the most iconic characters of all time, and you're throwing this sexualized bimbo into it. No, a bimbo would be funny. She's not, she didn't even work her way up to bimbo. Um, but the new Looney Tunes, is, that, that was a good addition. Whether you like the show or not, the new Looney Tunes show had a great Lola in it. It starred, uh, what's her name from, uh... Bridesmaids, oh, I'm blanking on her name. You're gonna yell at me later. But, uh, uh, that's a great character, and they did that well. 
Uh, Space Jam did not, and I think that sums up why they botched it up. So, um, yeah, that, that's one of my favorite moments. Number 10. The Tom and Jerry mindfuck and the Tom and Jerry Hamlet quote. I, I can't pick on this one. I like these both equally, so again, I have to cheat and put them in the same slide. But they're, so, they're from the same review. Um, the, the first one is when Tom and Jerry first talk, and uh, it involves me spitting, first spitting out water, then spitting out watermelon with sangria that I'd be drinking both at the same time, just forcing a joke <laughs> to the nth degree, uh, and, and putting saran wrap on the camera so that it wouldn't fly, you know, wouldn't hurt the camera. It actually slides down brilliantly, it's great. Um, and then it leads into this great soliloquy about what Tom and Jerry was, and, and what it meant, and what this movie has done to it, and so on and so forth. And uh, I like that moment because it's a legitimate, it's very funny, it's of course taking it something that really doesn't matter, you know what, Tom and Jerry, who, who cares, this bitch of the Tom and Jerry movie, nobody saw it, so it's not like it destroyed you know, an enterprise or anything. We still have the original cartoons. But at the same time, it's taking something I really loved and just doing something so stupid with it. So it's kind of showing the real love I had for that cartoon and the respect I had for it and acknowledging it in the most silly, over-the-top kind of poetic way. You know, I mean, it is essentially a poem. It's Shakespeare. Um, and manipulating the lines from Hamlet to represent that. Uh, and, and, and showing the, it, it's, I mean, it's obviously referencing Hamlet. The one I'm specifically referencing is the Kenneth Branagh one, because that's my favorite uh, film version. And, uh, and it dissolves to, you know, obviously it's him holding the skull of the jester. Uh, it dissolves to the jester and, and how they used to have fun and play along and stuff like that, and then back to the skull. And it's the same thing. It, it's showing images of Tom and Jerry and what it used to be and how grand it was and just what this piece of shit did to it. Uh, so that's great. I love that because it also shows the love I have for Tom and Jerry. Um, the other one is when just this chase scene is going on in the, the last third of it, and it's so bad fucking shit crazy. You just can't believe what you're watching. And it's going so fast and so crazy. I know they're trying to make it look like, you know, oh, isn't this wacky? How did it get to this silly turn of events? But you're just like, no, how did this occur? This is pure insanity and I, I have concerns for the person who came up with it and pretty much what we did is that i that's the first time i used the term mindfuck which i'm sure that term existed before me but it was the first time i used it in a video and we were playing the i'm not sick but i'm not well song just to the images of the chase and me like i lost my mind and it's one of those things where it's just like, I think as we were watching it, we were just laughing at the insanity of what we were watching and how it's like we kind of knew what they were trying to get across. It was making us laugh, but not for the same reasons I think they wanted. Um, and it just, thinking, every time I think of that chase scene and how insane it is, I mean, not like, oh, isn't that silly? It's like, no, mentally insane. You know, whoever came up with this, you know, had a lobotomy you know, or, or was dropped as a child, I don't know. But bottom line, you know, something obviously affected this, or these writers to come up with this, and they're just not well. They're not sick, but they're not well, I get. No, I, they're sick. Um, so just when I think of that scene, I think of that music, it just gets a big laugh out of me. I think it's the first time I've ever done something like, we've given up, or we've gone insane. If you can't beat them, join them, you know, kind of thing. And, uh, I love those, and it gives me a chance to act silly and speed up the film and stuff, so uh, both those moments really get a big laugh out of me. Number nine. The Ghost of Christmas Future from Babes in Toyland. Uh, not only is uh, Jim Trokin's performance as this ghost great, uh, actually, he came up to me one day, he was supposed to be one of the cloaks from uh, Suburban Nights, but, but the scheduling uh, had to change, so it didn't allow that. And it, uh, and he had this voice, and it's this really great voice, and he always said he wanted to be like the Grim Reaper or something. And I just wanted to write a character around that, so I came, around, I came up with this idea that everyone always does a Christmas Carol parody. Like, everyone in comedy does a Christmas Carol parody, and it makes sense. It's a great story, there's a lot of variations you can do with it, there's a lot of different angles you can do with it. Uh, and I was finally like, nah, but 
everybody does it. Let, let's make the joke that I won't do it and that somebody's actually trying to make me do it. Like, the, go, the joke's already started, but I won't play along with it. I won't go with it. And the first ghost that pops up is so determined to make this joke happen that he keeps popping up in the review, just like, I mean, in the interrupting other jokes to make this joke come true. And it just cracks me up. I love, my favorite, I think the one that makes me like piss my pants is when he comes up with the ghost of Christmas Phalus. That really kills me. Um, just me going. Okay, sorry. That's so immature laughing at your own jokes, um, but it's damn funny. Uh, that, I think, is a good laugh. Him acting as the puppet, and then you see it's him, and him marching in, you know, into the movie, actually trying to insert himself into the movie, trying to say that Obscurus Lupa is on board, and then seeing that he's practically kidnapped her, and then there's another spin on that joke, too. Uh, so it's... And then him getting drunk at the end. Oh! Love it. It's like the review itself is, you know, like an okay review, you know, and the movie is so spectacularly bad. But uh, those elements are just gold to me. I think those just play so well, and that voice is so funny, and the performance is so funny. I think the idea of interrupting this joke is so funny. Oh, really, really love it. Number eight. Bat credit card. And you're probably thinking to yourself, I am sick to death of this joke. Uh, parts of me kind of are, but then again, as I always say, if this is the worst part of my job, or like, I just have to be used to having people shout bad credit cards, I mean, that's a pretty damn good job, you know, I, I can't be a whiny bitch about that. Um, and honestly, I think it is a funny joke. I, I think it, it really did sum up just the final burnt bridge for those movies. I mean, not that it could really recover from the first whatever half of that film, but as soon as that came up, it's like, no, there's, it's the point of no return. You've, there's, as a Joker put, there's no going back. You've changed things forever. You're just a freak. Um, I mean, it's like, just, that was the nail in the coffin. Um, and I remember that's what, that, it was just that moment when I saw it when I was, like, in high school. And I wasn't liking the movie, but it was just that scene. Like, no, you really have no idea how this works, do you? <laughs> um, so, and, and I think the reactions off of, um, you know, the, the doctor coming in and constantly, uh, you know, trying to restrain me or whatever, and just how, how many times it keeps going, you think he's going to go back to the review, but then he flips out again. Um, and, yeah, I, I don't know if that image or, or that card or whatever was as infamous as it was before I came along. I'm probably trying to glorify myself, uh, but I, I never heard anybody talk about it, um, really, until I started. Even when I was talking about the movie, I'd always tell people, remember the bat credit card, and they always go, the what? Really? Was that in there? What? So I, I just want to make sure people never forget, never forget the bat credit card. Um, just say, it still sounds funny. So maybe that's why so many people yell at his stuff. It does sound so funny. Um, and it's, it's a good joke. And it, it's probably one of the biggest freakouts I ever had. And it, it was one of the earliest freakouts. So it's hard not to acknowledge it. And, you know, if someone shouts at a con, I'll still do the bit. I'll still go, pack credit card and go and try and punch him and stuff. Unless my voice is sore. I do tell some people. I'm just like, you know, I'm sorry, man. I, I've been yelling all week. I can't. I'll, I'll whisper it. Pack credit card. Ah. Um, so it, it's still a good joke. Eh? You know, it, I think maybe it is one of those, like, you know, it's a joke you heard over and over and over. And you start to get sick of it. But then when you give it a while, you come back to it. It's like, oh, yeah, that, that was pretty funny. So, um, I do like it, and I think it's a lot of people's favorite jokes. Not quite my favorite, but, uh, it's, it's good stuff. Number seven. Fucking bubbles! Yeah, I, I almost wish I could just put all the commercial series, you know, in here, because I think the commercials are so funny. It was such a good series. Um, and it was hard to pick which one, because I can't do them all from there, but, uh, it was hard to pick out which one was the funniest. I was just like, nah, it's gotta be, it's gotta be fucking Bubbles, <laughs> you know, and I don't know why. It's one of those, I mean, the commercial, you pretty much saw the commercial, you know, where it's like this kid is left 
you know, he's the new kid in the neighborhood, and everyone's just like, yeah, whatever, we, we don't know, uh, cast chase him, um, and, but, he has bubbles, and all of a sudden everyone's just like, whoa, and it's like, he has like a crowd, you know, he, he can fill like a stadium with people that he's showing bubble thing to, I, he called it bubble thing. Um, and he's just going around, and all the kids are it's like they're looking at Jesus. They're just looking like, Oh, say, don't you know what bubbles are? I mean, it's like, and, you know, so of course, I mean, I just kept playing up, you know, like this one kid has a Nintendo, and I'm like, fuck that shit, this kid has bubbles! All my problems, gone! I've been healed, thanks to bubbles! And it just get every time I see it, the one that gets the funniest part is just the very last line. You know, bubble thing from Whammo or whatever. You just hear in this very faint fucking bubbles. <laughs> and something about that faint fucking bubbles gets the biggest laugh. <laughs> and, and I probably abused it in other videos. I've used it too much for, I guess, bubbles keep popping up in the movies I review for some reason. Um, so I, I've had to use it a few times. And yeah, there's just... What else can you say? Fucking bubbles. Number six. The aliens from signs. Now what I mean specifically by this is when they're trying to sneak into the house. And this is that point where I was sort of telling myself I want to sort of keep away from just dubbing over the movie, just doing the Mystery Science Theater. Like, I want to actually sort of analyze it and talk about, you know, what's wrong with it. Because there was a point where I got too into that, where I was just putting voice over, I was just riffing it. Um, but I couldn't help it at this point. I mean, this was the point where it's like, we, we could just talk about every plot hole in this movie with them talking back and forth and do it in some sort of alien language. <laughs> and... And it still makes no sense. I mean, nothing about those aliens makes any sense. Nothing about that movie makes any sense. Stupid movie. But I digress. Um, the It's them trying to break into the house, and they boarded up the you know windows with wood. And, of course, whenever they come across it, they go, wood, or in the alien language, do call. And they're just terrified. They just, I don't, that, the wood, the wood. <laughs> Our, our, our advanced alien shits that could come down and terrify an entire about wood! Ah! Thank God they don't have any water in this planet. Fucking stupid. Okay. <laughs> People liked that movie when it came out. Oh, I'm, I'm being a dick. All right, all right. Um, so, so eventually there's one point where this noise is made. Like, you know, they're, they're trying to eat you see this... And we were joking, one of the aliens tried to ram into it with its head because they forgot to bring weapons or something sharp. Um, or fire, you know, because it's like, maybe that's why they're afraid of water and put out the fire. But I, I'm going to try and stop understanding the logic of that film. Um, and then there's one point where they're breaking in. You hear them break in, you hear them walk upstairs, and the family's still talking! It's like they should be running for shelter or... Find more wood! But, you know, they're just standing there and they don't read. And he's talking about the day you were born and stuff. The kid doesn't look very interesting. He looks very bored. Uh, and, and we're just like, are the aliens, like, so insulted by this by now? It's like, dude, are you really just talking over us while we're trying to break in? Aren't we scary at all? I mean, okay, I can understand. I mean, it's like the, the wood thing. Yeah, this makes sense. And then you're going to find out about the water and that, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But you know what? It's like, we're trying. Come on. Can't you at least flee a bit? And we just work that all into that one scene. It's like every stinking plot hole in that movie. Not all of them. God, there's even more. But that's what the review is for. Uh, so it's just one of those scenes. And the funny thing is that when I did this this review, I thought the big thing was going to be, um, you know, I, I, I don't even remember the joke, but I did something with a door. It wasn't the same thing, but it was like... Uh, I'm like, really, the, a door can stop a door can stop this alien or something. I do this great big thing, and I never got the joke quite right. I do this great big freak out, and I kept trying to re-edit it. I never got it right. And I was like, oh, man, everyone's going to say I was trying too hard, and this review is not good. Um, but it turns out that scene is really what, like, saved that review, uh, was those two aliens. And while I was editing it together, I'm like, okay, no, this is going to be okay. <laughs> so uh, that's definitely some good laughs out of that scene. Number five. Chica chica. 
Lucas, how can you not go fucking batshit for Lucas? Lucas from The Wizard is like one of the craziest characters and it was so much fun glorifying this guy. There's a little boy who's like obsessed with Nintendo. He's like the cool kid. He's like, you know, he's like the Terminator just ate Jesus and he has Jesus inside of him and now he's powered by Jesus. But because he's a Terminator, he's robotic, he understands all Nintendo games. And just looking at a Nintendo game, he can win it. And why the hell didn't I put that in the review? That's genius. But, uh, so you have this Lucas kid in the review that they build up. And we build him up even more. We play the chicka chicka music. Um, we, we have me watching him play the game. And I'm just, like, fainting about, you know, how, how incredibly talented he is. You know, just, oh! Oh, Lucas! Oh. And just going so over the top with it. And the kid is so into it. That's part of what makes it so funny. Uh, and his dialogue is terrible. <laughs> I love the power glove. It's so bad. I mean, how can... <laughs> it's it's great. Or, oh, we wouldn't want you to whiz on anybody. It's like, zing! <laughs> and it, I mean, it's... Of, of course, the joke is, you know, just how bad the character is, you know, how lame over the top, but they're so convinced how cool he is that he actually, in a strange way, becomes kind of cool, you know, to, like, the geek culture, so it's, uh, there you go, he's cool to geeks, <laughs> in a sense. So, um, yeah, I think so much of it just comes from the way that character was written, the way they played the music around him, and just how seriously that kid took it, so, and we just played it up as much as we could. And we didn't even need to that much. I mean, that's one of those where the movie just has half the jokes right there. And, uh, yeah, every single time. I actually did a riff on it at a con this year. Uh, uh, and, and we were all just, every time Lucas popped up, I mean, all the women were just like, Oh! 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 <laughs> Lucas! Even some of the men were like that, too. So, uh, fucking love Lucas. Number four. Reading Fifty Shades of Grey. All right, this is from uh, the Baby Geniuses 2 review, and what was happening here is that I knew that in this review I, I wanted to do something with uh, with Rental Floss and Uncle Yo, because I've been to cons with both of them. They're both phenomenally funny. I thought it'd be great if they were just constantly in it. I just had this running joke that they would constantly, every time they're trying to snap me out of it, they get distracted by wanting to read Fifty Shades of Grey. Uh, so we had this, and then I think... Team Four Star was at this con. This is at Kineticon, and they had an 18 and above panel. And one of the things they were doing, I forget if they already had the book or if I had the book or how it worked. Um, but I crashed it. I came in, and we talked about reading Fifty Shades of Grey in different voices. Um, so we started doing that. You can still see it on YouTube. It's it's like a four or five part video. It's very very funny. I mean, you thought the voices at the end of this video were, were funny. I mean, watch this YouTube video. I mean, you'll, you'll laugh your ass off. That guy's... Uh, what's the name? Tony's uh, uh, Nicolas Cage. I actually fell to the ground laughing in this video because it was so funny. Uh, <laughs> but I digress. Uh, so it went over really, really well. People were just howling at it. And we must have done it for like an hour. Just these different voices and people just could not get enough of it. We couldn't get enough of it. So it's kind of like, you know what? We should just work this into the video, because originally it's just going to end with me, Brent, and uh, Carl on the bed reading Fifty Shades of Grey, and then we're, I was like, do you guys have the time? Can you come up and shoot this real fast? Like, yeah, yeah. So we just decided which voice everyone was going to do, and the rest was just improvised. We just found a page we thought would be funny, and went from there, and that whole ending, as you can probably tell, you know, is improvised. Um, and... Even the bit where we're doing the high fives and everything, and then we all get up and leave. I mean, it's just, we just kept it going and going, and uh, it's just so funny. I, I think people take that clip, even just, they don't even watch the rest of the review, they just take that clip and put it on YouTube as something like seven or eight grown men reading Fifty Shades of Grey on a hotel bed. It's like, yes, please, click. Um... And the impressions are so funny, and everyone in it is so funny. Us laughing is so funny, and I think it's just a genuinely... It feels very genuine, just we're all having a good time. People are having fun watching us have a good time. They're laughing at the jokes, and not the jokes, the, uh, the impressions, just the writing. <laughs> and they... 
uh, I have good memories of that con, and I have good memories of uh, of the people and filming that, and it was just, it, it was great fun, and I think it comes through in the video and other people get great fun from it as well. Number three. Uh, this was the first con I ever went to, and I said, I want to make a splash. Um, so pretty much, we went in, I knew I knew I had to do something, I'd never been to a con, and I, I wanted to go to more, <laughs> you know, so I might as well make my mark somehow, and uh, I knew, I was like, okay, well, and it was during the weekend, which is usually when I shot the NC, so I knew, it's like, okay, I have to write this in somehow. And I just had this idea where I'd be chasing Casper at the end of it. Um, so I told the people, I said, okay, just at the end of this panel, I'm going to come in and we're going to start filming. I'm not going to tell you what's going on. I, I just want you to go with it. Everyone went, okay, okay. And so I leave, I get in my Ghostbuster outfit, I just come in and I'm just like, you know, where's Casper? Have you seen Casper? Uh, where's Casper? And they're like, he's over there. Go, get him, get him, get him. I'm like, get down, get down. And... We just kept going and going. I remember before we started filming, I took a look and I saw the pool there and I just told Rob, I was like, you know, Rob, I think I'm going to have to jump in that pool. And he just went, okay. <laughs> you know, it's like, he's not going to stop me. It'll, it'll be good internet. So, uh, we, I, I just got the crowd going and following me and stuff like that and animating the Casper in there and, uh, I think it was so great because it was just such a rush of people. And actually, I think another panel was going on out there, which we interrupted, uh, which I do kind of feel bad about. But, um, yeah, we, we were just rushing and, and doing all this stuff. And uh, I think just how much the people got into it as well as uh, as I did and how, how much they were willing to go along with it, how much some were willing to stay in character. It was like a Joker and a Harley, and they were staying in character the whole time. And uh, it was just... It was great having that energy. It was great going in not knowing how it was going to turn out either. I didn't know if we were going to get thrown out or what. Um, and just knowing... And the way it was shot, Rob, is he's so good at, you know, sort of that live, you know, capturing the video and stuff. Because he always knows where to point the camera and who to have it on and at what point. And he gets this stuff just in time and just at the right angles. And it's tough to do. Uh, because you got a crowd of people and everyone's shouting something and you're not... What, was that funny to go over here? Is this person, you know, and even watching me, because I'll, I'll just go for whatever somebody's saying and suddenly switch focus and say, he's so good at capturing that and really comes through in that video. Um, and it's just so funny. It's such a good ending to that review. And I, I really do think it's one of my best reviews. Um, that's just a great end to that character, too, <laughs> to, to Casper. Although, of course, he never truly ends, you know, with the timing joke. Um, but, yeah, it was... It was so much fun to do. It looks great. Gets a great reaction. Ton of fun. Number two. Dirty little kitty. Dirty, dirty little kitty. This comes from a really funny... This is a pretty funny review. This is another one of those that didn't quite make the top 11 favorite reviews, but it's pretty close. Um, and I think... This was like my favorite joke for the longest time because... I love the lead-in. I love, uh, it's watching these two women fight each other in mud, and they get dirtier and dirtier, and it's just, and their clothes are getting ripped, and they're getting tighter, and they're getting, it's like, obviously it's fan service. I mean, it's like, you know, there's no doubt about it. The character that she's fighting in, like, I don't even know if she comes back or what she was or anything. Um, and it just starts with, um, me, you know, talking about how stupid it is and I'm starting to get, you know, turned on by it and getting into it. And then Bargo comes in and I push him out of the way. And you know, alright, so that's one thing. And then he comes in again and then another friend comes in and then my brother comes in. We're all watching and just getting more and more into it. And we just start screaming and yelling and getting into it. Just everyone shouting something different. And if you go back and watch the video, what everyone is saying is funny. Uh, you know, and, and it's pretty funny, you know, oh, we should do this every week. I think at one point Rob just goes, wowzers, and it, it's so wonderful. Finally, when I say shut up, Bargo keeps going, not realizing that we've all gone quiet. He just says, oh, yes, you're a dirty little kitty, aren't you? Just a dirty, dirty little kitty, and it's, and we all just look at him like he's insane. He can probably tell we're trying not to crack up, and it's just a 
great moment <laughs> of just somebody. Because, you know, like I said, we everybody shouts something different during one of those scenes. And just to hear what one person is saying throughout that whole thing, especially knowing that everyone else has gone quiet and they can hear him, it's just hilarious. It's just so funny. And he is so into it. I mean, you just see him. He's just talking through his TV. Oh, yes, you are, a dirty little kitty. <laughs> I think at some point, I think the way it came across is we were going to do a sketch where uh, somebody just hears in the other room, Oh, you're a dirty little kitty, aren't you? A dirty, dirty little kitty. And just, oh, yes, oh, I'm going to touch you all over. Oh, yes, I'm going to make you clean, aren't I? And the person looks really concerned, and then it turns out inside is a person just cleaning their cat, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, so we can never figure out how to work that in, but we just loved Bargo saying, Dirty little kitty. And a lot of times when we wanted him to recreate something, he usually couldn't. Uh, so the fact that he could actually get, get it that time and say it just as good as he usually did, it was just such a, an epic laugh, you know? And you, sometimes when I go to cons, I bring, like, autograph prints, and one of them is Dirty Little Kitty. And uh, it's... Oh, it, it, it makes me laugh so hard. It's just... It, I think it's a great joke. <laughs> And my number one favorite nostalgia critic joke is... Mara Wilson. I know I've gone friggin' on and on about this woman like a million times, but this is my favorite joke. <laughs> it just is, and I... And how well she gets into it, and, and how much she throws her all into it, and... <laughs> And just the ability to bring out these videos uh, of me as a, you know, as a young kid, especially at a point when everyone was like, they saw some of these videos I put out before and they're like, oh, they're not that bad for that age. That's actually pretty good and blah, blah, blah. And I was always thinking to myself, one day I'll show you the bad stuff, like the really bad stuff. Uh, and that was the time to finally show it. And again, I think a lot of people know the story behind the whole Mara Wilson thing where uh, there was a misunderstanding. She thought I was being really serious about the stuff. And then when she found out that, you know, I wasn't, she, you know, was very apologetic. And just, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then there was talk about possibly doing, you know, like a, uh, some sort of crossover or something. And we brought it up. She was so enthusiastic about it. And it just made for, I think, the funniest moment. In fact, I think my funniest, probably the funniest thing I ever said in any of the shows, honestly, is just her name when she first appears. I think the buildup of talking about her for so long, and then suddenly as she appears, I mean, as an adult, which, like, nobody online has seen. I mean, like, practically nobody has seen her as an adult. And for her to appear, I just look at her, I just go, Mara Wilson? I mean, it's just this clarification of, yes, you are seeing a grown-up Mara Wilson. She is in this video. She has this unbelievably good sense of humor to go along with this up here and done something that she hasn't done for years, which is, you know, appear on video and, you know, and, and put it out there for everyone to see. And it's just so funny. And I... I don't even know what to say about it because I've said so much about it. And it was probably the most fun I ever had editing something. It's the, probably some of the most time I've ever put into editing something because I wanted it to be just right. You know, and the, the review itself is very funny and, and I worked very hard on it and edited it a lot. But I mean, it was like hours and hours of editing that last like two minutes maybe. And... <laughs> and, and the laugh and the don't fuck with Mara Wilson and it's just... You know, thank God people can have such a good sense of humor and they can open up and they can take a chance with something and it, you know, all because of jokes. All because, you know, people just want to have fun with stuff and make other people feel better through comedy and it's just, it's just the coolest thing. And who the fuck would have thought, you know, growing up, if you told me while I was a little kid watching Mrs. Doubtfire, you're going to have a scene <laughs> with that little girl right there when she grows up. I, who, who the fuck would believe that? And, and she's gonna school you and she's gonna turn to the devil and she, her eyes are gonna glow and stuff like that. It's gonna be this huge thing. I mean, it's... It, it's a great job where you can, uh... <laughs> that can come true and that can happen. And, and it's a great world where people like that can agree to it and, and say, yeah, let's, let's do this because it's funny. And it's just, it's... 
It's a joke that's not only hilarious, but I think it so puts you in a good mood because it just shows what can come out of essentially what started off as a negative situation and, you know, could could turn into something childish and mean, but instead you turn it into something smart and funny. And that's... it. It's a joke that just puts me in a good mood. Um, on top of just making me laugh, it just puts me in a good mood just knowing... Just knowing this world is so strange that stuff like that can happen. Um, so, I think I've gone on long and long enough. Uh, next week, you are going to see the first episode of Demo Reel. That will be coming out to you. It will be a special uh, one-hour episode. And, uh, yeah, I've had a lot of fun talking about these and talking about the nostalgia critics and all that good stuff. And uh, hopefully you guys like what's coming up next. So, um, hope everything's going good in your lives, and I shall talk to you later.